graduated from the university, graduated from the University Federal of Minas Gerais. Then he has a PhD from the University Federal of de Souza. They're both institutions in Brazil. He actually spent some time doing doing his PhD working with uh, with Dr. Ginter at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, in which uh, during that time he uh, was able to hone his abilities with ultrasonography. And now he's a faculty member, he's an associate professor uh, at the uh, School of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Science at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, he's one of the global experts in uh, ultrasonography and especially Doppler ultrasonography with applications in uh, beef cattle, dairy cattle, horses, uh, for so it's a it's it's a very diverse career that he developed, and for tonight uh, he will focus mostly uh, on the, the beef cattle applications of the Doppler ultrasonography. Uh, during the 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 the, the, the webinar, and especially at the end, uh, you're welcome to place your questions in the Q and A box or just ask the questions at the end when uh, Dr. Pugliese finishes his presentation. So without further ado, uh, thank you, Guilherme, very much for accepting to speak uh, as a, 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 on this webinar. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mario. Um, I'd like to thank uh, uh, you and uh, Dr. Vito Metrodanti for the invitation. Uh, for me, it's a great honor to be here uh, in this webinar. Uh, I have been following uh, some of them uh, the, the last year and uh, I really enjoyed. And for me, it's, uh, it's a great honor to be here to talk about uh, what we have been doing uh, with Doppler and applied to post in Brazil and also uh, how can you use that um, especially in, in time AI and time rainbow transfer programs. So I'd like first to, to share here, just a second, let me see here. Okay, here you go. Uh, these are the topics that I, I wanna go through today. Uh, so starting up, uh, talk about how to evaluate the corpus luteum by Doppler ultrasonography. Then it's used uh, for early detection of non-pregnancy and also associate with uh, protocols for resynchronization of ovulation cattle. And at the end, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, about the, the use of Doppler in select of recipients uh, in time embryo transfer programs. So to start, I'd like to, to just remember some important events uh, related to uh, early pregnancy in cattle. So this slide here, we can see um, really special events during the first two weeks of pregnancy in ruminants. And I like to highlight uh, what's um, going on here with the corpus luteum during its development. So we can see that uh, we have active angiogenesis, especially during early diastasis, during the first uh, seven days of uh, after ovulation. And after that, uh, we know that the, the embryo has started to, to expand and secrete a great amount of interferon tau, and this interferon tau, this glycoprotein, uh, it's really important to maintain the corpus luteum function and also to maintain the pregnancy uh, in cattle. So as you can see here in this blue line, uh, the progesterone profile, that's the main hormone uh, synthesized by, by the corpus luteum that I'm gonna call here today as a CL. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's elevated. In, in the bloodstream. And if the, the coral septums, it's present here, so the corpus luteum function has to be maintained. So the, the P4, uh, the progesterone has to be elevated to maintain the pregnancy. And at this period, uh, at between the second, third week of pregnancy, the vascular, um, the, the vascular architecture is already uh, formed. So we say that to have a maturation of the corpus luteum, we have a difference in format in color here, but uh, the most important thing here is to maintain the corpus luteum function to secrete uh, progesterone and maintain this pregnancy. Well, uh, when you talk about the corpus luteum function, uh, it's important to highlight uh, that it's uh, very uh, related to, 
to its composition. To secrete progesterone, we need, uh, uh, um, we need some substrate and also some hormones to stimulate the P4 secretion. So when you look at the cell composition of the CL, uh, we can see that uh, about half of the cells are endothelial, uh, endothelial cells. So that's the cell that compound the, uh, the vessels, right? So the, the secretion, the synthesis and secretion of P4, it's really correlate with this uh, blood flow. Uh, it's really intense in the, the CL of the cattle. And because of that, um, the idea here is, how, uh, is to show how can you use the Doppler ultrasonography to evaluate this CL function. So based on the, the vascularization, the, the, the blood perfusion, uh within the the luteal cells right so to do that we have some different modes um to use the doppler so today we're not going to talk about the last uh, option here that's the pulse wave or we can call also a spectral mode that's the mode that we we need uh, a large vessel and this is kind of a uh, time consume for 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 to do that on the field because uh, it's not not so applied. So today uh, the idea is to show how to use the color Doppler and also the power Doppler. That's uh, these two modes uh, we can do um, evaluation in real time. Um, I'm gonna show in the next slide how how to do that. Well, the first step uh, is to to find the the ovary containing the CL. Uh, this is a typical uh, grayscale uh, image. As you can see here, the corpus luteum uh, in this uh, gray image here. And when you have the Doppler uh, turned on, uh, we can see uh, color signals covering the, the grayscale image. And if you look at here in the right side of this slide, uh, we can see that most of the color signals, they are in the border of the corpus luteum and go into the center. And this uh, occurs because if you look at the, to the active study of the, the CL, uh, the angiogenesis is coming from the periphery to the center, right? Even if it's a, it's a cavitary CL, uh, we can see here in the border more color signals. And when you look at your 3D image, we can see the structure of the vessels that they're more pronounced in the, the border and go to the center. So this is two typical images of the amastic cell or and the cavitary cell, right? Well, uh, the first question here is how to evaluate the corpus luteal function, the, the blood perfusion. So we can go to objective methods for example, you can measure the color area. So you can use a cursor here and measure that. And you can also count the pixels, the colored pixels. But in both cases, uh, they're time constant. So this is uh, take time and maybe it's not, not the best option if you go to, to the field to, to scan the animals. So what we are doing and what we're gonna show here uh, it's an uh, alternative to do that that's uh, based on a subjective uh, evaluation. So uh, we can consider as a score, it's one option. For example, you can say that the corpus luteum, uh, it's active or functional or not. And also we can say that has a low, medium or high uh, blood perfusion, consider a score, for example, from one to four. So this is one alternative. But uh, other alternative is to consider as a proportion of the luteal uh, area. So in this case, it's, it's quite similar to what we do for sperm motility. So we're going to consider from 0 to 100, what's the proportion of that cell area, the, the cell tissue that we are seeing that has color signals of blood perfusion. So, and then you go uh, by five points of uh, per person. And this is what we are doing for research. And also uh, we are using that on the field for evaluation of the CL blood perfusion. So from zero to, to 100. Well, 
um, we we have some uh, early studies show, showing how the CL uh, blood perfusion is also correlated with P4 concentrations. And this is a really interesting study from uh, Bovens group. And we can see here at different uh, phase of the CL development, have the growth phase, the static phase, and then the regression phase during the SO cycle here. And in this graph, we can see the relative change of P4 concentrations. Uh, you can see here in this uh, gray squares. Uh, sorry, here is, is the, the size. Um, and we can see here in this black cycles here, the P4 concentration and the relation with the blood perfusion and also the relative change of the size of the CL. So during the growth phase, they really correlate. So the size, the CL blood perfusion and also the P4. But when you look at the static phase, uh, there's some uh, uh, correlation here lost. And also during the regression phase, uh, we can see that the, the relative chains are pretty close between the P4 concentration and the luteal blood perfusion, but not with the size of the CL. So when these authors here did the correlation analysis, they could see that uh, during the growth phase and the regression phase, we have a, a significant and high correlation between the, uh, the size of the CL and the P4, but not in the static phase. And the most interesting thing was that when they look at for the correlation with the blood perfusion, uh, the correlation was greater uh, for the regression phase compared to the size, a little bit more high for the blood perfusion. And also they uh, detect a significant correlation it was low here, but they detect a significant correlation with the static phase. So, after that, we also run a study, but in this case, in Bosidicus cattle, uh, where we studied the correlations between P4 concentrations and the luteal blood perfusion and the luteal area, the luteal size. And you can see here, again, the correlations are higher or greater when you compare the P4 and luteal blood perfusion than uh, the luteal size, right? And also an interesting information here, if you look at the, per, uh, the percentage here, the proportion of luteal blood perfusion, as I have mentioned before, from zero to 100, right? Uh, we have a cutoff point here, that's 30%. So animals that has less than 30% of the luteal tissue with the color signals indicate blood perfusion, they have a really low uh, P4 concentration in the blood was less than one nanogram. So this indicated that these animals uh, with this blood perfusion, uh, they don't have active, a functional CL in the over, right? So based on that, we can see some images showing how the uh, these changes occur. So here it's uh, during the lute uh, spontaneous luteolysis. Uh, this stood from Miyamoto's group. We can see on day 19 of the SO cycle that the CL has, it still has a, a, a good size, but the luteal perfusion has already decreased. And the same occur after a treatment with a PGF2 alpha analogy. So after 24 hours, the size of the CL is almost the same. Uh, if you compare with the, the, the time before the treatment, uh, but the luteal blood perfusion have a decreasing, right? So this is just two examples uh, to how uh, we can see through the, the CL blood perfusion that the function have already uh, reduced. And this is uh, just a result that we got uh, during my PhD with Dr. Ginter at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, during the luteal period, so when the P4 concentration is going down here, that take about 24 hours, uh, we can see a greater decrease in the CL blood perfusion uh, than we compare with the CL error. So uh, altogether, these studies is indicated to us that uh, we have a greater correlation between P4 and uh, luteal uh, blood perfusion at this period of lute uh, lute luteolysis in cattle. 
And based on that, uh, what we're gonna show here is how to use that uh, in two uh, different strategies in cattle. So the first one is to detect the early pregnancy. Uh, 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 what, what you can see, it's not the pregnancy actually, but the, the non-pregnancy status. So uh, the other option is the selection of the recipient at a uh, time embryo transfer. So I'm gonna start first with the early detection of non-pregnancy and then I'm gonna move on to it using time AI programs. So, a basic information that I just mentioned, uh, we did a, a study here with Mario Binelli at the University of Sao Paulo uh, 10 years ago. And we can see uh, in, this, in this slide here that animals that got pregnant after time AI, uh, they have the P4 concentration maintained the blood. So this is plasma uh, progesterone concentration. But if the, the cows did not uh, get pregnant, we have a reduction in P4 concentration between day 15 and 18 after the time AI. Uh, but as the luteolis, uh does not occur at the same time in all, all animals, uh, you only got a different uh, concentration between pregnant and non-pregnant animals uh, starting from day 20. So before day 20, uh, after uh, time AI, uh, maybe you cannot get this, this difference between the animals. And the same occur when you look at the uh, blood perfusion and also the CL area. So at day 20, you have a, a significant difference between pregnant and non-pregnant animals. So based on that, uh, we decide to do a second experiment in this, uh, this study here. And the criteria used was to detect the non-pregnant animals, so based on the luteolis uh, occurrence here. So in what we use as a criteria was consider the CL uh, with less than two centimeters square and with less than 30% of blood perfusion in its area. So here we have uh, two good examples of animals that you consider as pregnant in A and B. Uh, have more than 30% here for sure in this both case. And also in E and F, you have two good examples here of non-pregnant animals, that the animals that we are really in detect because uh, this CL is incompatible with uh, the pregnancy maintained. So we cannot maintain a good level of progesterone in the bloodstream to maintain the pregnancy. So, but what about uh, this in real time? So I have two videos here, two clips, just to show uh, how quick is the evaluation here in the uh, B mode and now in the Doppler, you can see in the, uh, this video, a good CL. And here in this uh, video, in the uh, CL of animal that's not pregnant. So we have some color signals uh, in the border, but not in the center of the corpus luteum. So we consider this animal as no pregnant, right? But the question now is what about the accuracy if you compare this uh, with other methods to diagnose pregnancy? Well, the problem is that we don't have any accurate method at day 20 as we're doing here, this, this diagnosis. So we have to compare with uh, uh, the highest uh, method that we can do in the earliest moment that's on day 28 or 30 uh, of pregnancy but by visualization of the embryo with the heart beats. So if you do that, if you compare the, the use of Doppler 20 days after our insemination, for example, uh, with this uh, conventional method on day 30, we have 10 days of difference. Uh, so we are not at the same moment to, to compare them. But this is what we did, uh, was the only possibility to, to compare the accuracy. So, and this is a, a table showing several studies that did the same comparison. Uh, the first one was done by Matt Ute in 2009, but uh, at that point, they did not uh, find a really high accuracy. So I'll not go to this study. I just wanna highlight 
the two pioneer studies that was performed in Brazil, one by Luis Gustavo Siqueira in Embrapa, and the other one that we perform in beef cattle. So what we found in both studies was a high occurrence. For dairy, uh, they got 75% of accurate results, and we got 91% uh, of accuracy, right? Uh, when you look at the, the wrong results, the inaccurate results, uh, we can see that the false negative, so when you're saying that a cow is not pregnant and it's, uh, then we find an embryo, a viable embryo, uh, was quite low, so it was 0.5% here and here was 0%. Uh, so the problem is the false positive result. So we're saying that the, the animal has active CL on day 20, but then when you're going to check by the gold standard method on day 30, for example, we do not see a viable embryo. And this is higher in dairy animals compared to beef. Uh, not only these two pioneer studies that I said, but if you look at the other studies that came after that uh, from different groups around the world, uh, we can see that the false negative was quite low or zero in most of the studies. Uh, in beef, the false positive was a little bit lower compared to the dairy. So we are having here a false positive rate uh, ranging from five to 16, 17 maximum for beef. And the rates of false positive are greater than 25% for their care in these studies. So this has also been done in small ruminants. Uh, we have a group in, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, showing uh, also high accuracy for goats at, after day 21 and sheep after day 17. So also showing uh, a high um, rate uh, of uh, negative creative values. So it, it means that we are not having false negative results in this uh, in this method. And also another important point, when you look at the beef, that's the, the main goal here today for this, for this talk, uh, this study performed by Gabriela Dalmazo, it's really interesting because we compared um, Boss indicos, it was in a lot of animals here, so heifers and suckled cows on day 20 after the insemination. And when you compare the accuracy, we can see a lower accuracy in heifers compared to calves. And this occur because of a, a greater rate of false positive results in heifers. And this is being really consistent with it, the studies in beef. So, but which factors are related to these false positive results? Well, we can maybe sit some here. Uh, pregnancy loss could be one of the factors. Late ovulation, the protocol, because we're doing time AI, so we are not checking the time of ovulation. So some of them could be of, not be really uh, synchronized and have a late ovulation, the protocol. Uh, also, late luleods uh, can occur in some type of animals. So we know that dairy and heifers may have a later uh, time of luleods compared to beef and suckled cows. So, but the, the tough question here is what's the proportion of each of these uh, these factors, right? So I not be I will not be able to answer that today, but I just want to highlight here one of the the the, the factors. So in this study performed by Gabriela that I just showed, uh, we checked the false positive result that was almost 9%, 8.9% of the results were false positive. So, and then at day 20, we look at the expression of uh, interferon stimulated genes in peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So these genes are stimulated by interferon, and interferon tau, as we mentioned in the beginning of this talk, uh, can stimulate these genes in several uh, tissues and also in the immune cells in circulation. So when you look at the expression of these genes that could be confirmed that these animals are pregnant or not, 
uh, we saw that half, almost half of them has the increase of one, uh, at least one gene. So we look at two, two genes in this study. But 32% uh, of them, they have increase of both genes. So that indicates to us that probably at least one third of these false positive results, they're likely to be uh, related to the pregnancy loss. So because you have both genes being uh, increased in these animals. So part of that uh, could be uh, corresponding to these false positive results. Uh, in the same study, we did another analysis that was uh, to see the correlation, the, the, the association between the little blood perfusion and the probability of the false positive results. And as you can see here in this regression analysis, as the luteal blood perfusion increase, you have a reduction in the probability of a false positive results, right? Uh, the same was mentioned by uh, Pedro Fontes' group. So in one of his studies, uh, they see that the luteal blood perfusion uh, related by the proportion, as I mentioned, was lower in animals uh, considered as a false positive compared to those uh, detected as a true positive. So all this information together uh, um, indicate to us that you can see uh, a correlation between um, blood perfusion and the probability of a false positive result. So we decide to run another study. In this case here, uh, we look at the, the relationship between CL blood perfusion and the false positive results or the pregnancy loss in heifers and permipedus cows. So what we did here was uh, a time AI, then we did the first uh, diagnosed by Doppler on day 22, that's day 22. And we did three uh, uh, checks of the pregnancy. So we did by B mode ultrasonography uh, about day 30, then about day 60, and around three to five months of pregnancy. So the idea here is to see uh, what's the relationship between the, the CL blood perfusion and the pregnancy loss during this period. And for that, uh, we split the animals in two categories uh, with low or high blood perfusion. And what we saw was that the false positive result was lower for heifers, uh, sorry, for cows compared to heifers, as I had just mentioned before. Uh, we did not see a difference for early uh, pregnancy loss between these two categories and then a reduction in late pregnancy loss in cows. But the most interesting result was when you look at the two categories of blood perfusion. So when you compare high and low, uh, we saw a greater a false positive rate for animals with a low blood perfusion at the time of the PREG check. So all of the animals had active CL, right? So, but those with low, they have a great proportion of false positive results. And also the late pregnancy loss, that was the loss between uh, two months and then the confirmation about four months uh, of pregnancy was greater for animals having a low blood perfusion. And that was confirmed for uh, uh, with a regression analysis. So we can see for all this pregnancy loss period, uh, a negative correlation between CL blood perfusion and the probability of uh, false positive, early pregnancy loss, or late pregnancy loss. So with that information, I'm going to move to how to use that in the resynchronization protocols uh, using the Doppler between day 20 and 22 to do this uh, early detection of non-pregnancy. So uh, we know that we can uh, resynchronize uh, a cattle after a, a time AI or a time embryo transfer. And then that can be done in different ways. So the conventional way is to start at the traditional early pre uh, the pre check by uh, visualization of an embryo with heartbeat on day 30, for example. But if you do that and you start a protocol 
uh, hormone protocol to synchronize the ovulation, we're going to finish with an uh, interval between services about 40 days, right? Another option is to start uh, the protocol of resynchronization without knowing the pregnancy status. So we can do that, for example, day 22, 23. Then uh, we can do the preg check, the traditional one, and finish the protocol and induce the ovulation to have a reduction in the interval between services. But with that, we can reduce about seven, nine days, not more than that. But now, uh, with the Doppler, as I mentioned, that we can do a preg check uh, on day 20, 22 to detect the non pregnant animals. Uh, we can start this protocol that we're ca calling super early resynchronization uh, on about day 12, 14 after the first service. So that means that on day 20, 22, we do the Doppler and we induce the ovulation for insemination on about uh, two days later. And with that, we can reduce the interval between service to 22 uh, to 24 days. All right. So this is the idea of this type of protocol associated with the Doppler. And this is just a slide to show how can we reduce the interval between services. Uh, if you compare the conventional resynchronization with this type of super early resynchronization. So depending on the day that you're going to start and do the, the, the Doppler, we can have a 21 to 24 days between the services compared to the 40 days for the conventional one. And if you do, for example, here, three services that you can reach a, about 80, 85% of pregnancy rate, uh, we can reduce uh, the interval for this three time AI, the period for the, this three time AI in about one month, more a little bit more than that. So this in a great season can be a, a great impact as I'm gonna show uh, in the next slides. So, but the question now is how can, how can you use these protocols, these hormone protocols uh, in this period that we don't know if the animal is pregnant or not. So uh, we're, you're talking about a period before the pregnancy recognition period, uh, as you see in the beginning of this presentation. So the peak of the interferon tau is, about, is occurring uh, about the, around day 20. So if you start this resynchronization day 12, 14, uh, depending on the hormone that we are uh, using, for example, the stradiol oysters, uh, we can be inducing uh, the synthesis of prostaglandin of 2 alpha before uh, this occur. So that, that can be a risk for the pregnancy, right? So because of that, uh, we decide to, to look to some alternatives to do this type of protocol. So I do not have time to mention all these studies in detail. So I left here a QR code. So who are going to, is interested to see these studies in detail? They are all of them from our group. And, but I'm just going to show two examples. One is using uh, injectable P4 and also a reduced dose of stradiol that we can, uh, at least until now, can use uh, in South America. So what about the stradiol? The stradiol use at this period is really controversial because we have some studies showing a negative impact uh, depending on the, the type of animal that you are you, uh, working and also the dose. Uh, but there are other studies showing no effect of this dose. So looks like if you look, use a low dose of stradiol, maybe you are not impacting the ongoing pregnancy. So because of that, we decided to do a study in heifers. Uh, this was performed by Igor during his uh, master's degree in Brazil. And he worked with beef uh, animals. Uh, most of them are Nelore animals, but have some F1 Angus Nelore here. And what he did was after 14 days uh, post the first time AI, uh, we split the animals in three groups. So all of them receive an uh, intravaginal P4 device. Um, one group did not receive any further treatment. 
the other group received the addition of one milligram of uh, sodile benzoate. And the last group received a commercial product containing one milligram of uh, 70 beta sodile plus nine milligrams of P4. So the idea here was to have a better uh, resynchronization with these molecules, but also uh, without impacting the ongoing pregnancy. So we maintain the device until day 22. Uh, at the time we did uh, a preg check by Doppler, detected non-pregnant animals and disseminate them on day 24. So after that, we just did uh, confirmatory preg checks. So uh, we can see here the results of the first MAI. So there was no impact of the stradiol benzoate or 17 beta on the ongoing pregnancy. So for the doper on the confirmatory preg check and also the false positive result uh, was not different among the groups. And for this, the resynchronization, we can see that the pregnancy, uh, the conception rate was greater for the animals receiving the additional of uh, stradiol benzoate. So that means that using uh, only the P4 device, maybe you are not reaching the maximal of pregnancy rate in this type of protocol. Uh, another uh, attempt that we did was using the injectable P4. And in this case, we start the protocol day 13. So we did in beef cattle and also in heifers. Uh, the difference in between the groups here was just giving 100 milligrams of injectable P4 on one group and the other just receive uh, P4 intravaginal device. In this case, we did the same uh, Doppler on day 22 and the second time AI on day 24. But we repeat again this protocol. So we have three time AIs in this case in 48 days, right? And here are the results. Uh, we can see when you add the P4, the injector P4, we have a greater pregnancy rate uh, was about 5% of difference between uh, the animals that not received. So again, uh, maybe just giving the P4 device, you're not reaching the maximal uh, repetitive efficiency in this uh, resynchronization protocols. But at the end of the day, we had here a really good result. So in heifers and cows, uh, using this type of protocols, regardless if you receive or not injectable P4, was about 77% for heifers and 83% for uh, cows, right? So what about the impact of this super early resynchronization with Doppler? Uh, again, here, I'm not gonna show in detail, but we have in the same care code, these two studies performed by uh, Oscar Alejandro Rojas, uh, that he, he did his um, PhD in Brazil with Dr. Augusto Gamero, and they did a simulation model to compare different strategies. And of, one of them were the resynchronization with Doppler. And he could show in this study that we can increase the number of births at the beginning of the birth season using this type of protocol, super early resynchronization, as I just showed. Uh, also, they show that we have an improvement on the total weight of winning calves. And we can also have an increase in the proportion of heifers in puberty at the beginning of birth, the birth season. So that's really important when you talk about uh, Bosintico's cattle, as we know, uh, they, they are not so precautious uh, regarding um, puberty. So if you can have uh, animals uh, born at the beginning of birth season, we can have a better condition for them. But at the end of the day, uh, we have a greater total income and cost because you're using more hormones, also have the cost of the equipment. But when you, you, you compare the income and the cost, we, we could see a reduced cost per kilogram of winning calves using this type of protocols, right? So I'm gonna move now to the, the last stop here. I have some minutes remaining. Uh, we're going to talk about the use of Doppler for select of recipients. And uh, the first thing when you're going to select select a recipient for to receive an embryo um, 
produced in vitro or in vivo, uh, is that she needs to have a, a, a CL, right? Uh, and in this case here, we usually look to the size of the CL. So we can have a greater size CL or a small CL here. Well, but when you look at the Doppler in these uh, three different animals, uh, maybe the correlation with the size and the blood perfusion, it's not so high. And so sometimes the smallest CL is the one that has the highest blood perfusion. But the question is, uh, which CL characteristic is the most important for select of these recipients at the time of the embryo transfer? So to answer that, uh, the first study was performed by Fabio Pinafi. And in this case here, he has a limited number of animals, but he could show that animals uh, with up to 40% of blood perfusion and animals with more than 40, they have here a similar size of the corpus luteum, but, but the pregnancy rate was greater for those with a high blood perfusion, right? So another group from Japan also compared pregnant and non-pregnant animals in this case. Uh, they show here that the blood perfusion area, the, the area of uh, present the blood perfusion, the corpus luteum, was greater for animals uh, detected as pregnant compared to non-pregnant animals. And they also uh, did not see any difference in the size or the P4 concentration between pregnant and non-pregnant animals. So what we decided here was to do applied study uh, in commercial farms in Brazil. So we transferred uh, 444 uh, in vitro producing embryos. And at that moment of the embryo transfer, we split the animals, we classified them in three different categories of blood perfusion. So low, medium, or high blood perfusion. We also look at the size of the CL uh, and classify them as a small, medium, or large CL. And then we can see here the results. When you compare pregnant and non-pregnant animals, we did not see any difference in size or serum before, but we did see a difference in the luteal blood perfusion. So pregnant animals, they have a higher uh, blood perfusion in the corpus luteum. When you compare the categories of luteal size, you do not see a difference among them, but when you look at the luteal blood perfusion, those animals with a high blood perfusion, uh, the corpus luteum, they had greater pregnancy rate. So at the end of the study, we did uh, another type of analysis, we did a regression analysis. And in this case, you can see a quadratic relationship between luteal size and probability of pregnancy. Uh, but for luteal blood perfusion, the, the, the relationship was a linear and positive uh, association. So as the luteal blood perfusion increase, we have an increase in the probability of pregnancy, right? And to finish here, uh, we perform a similar study, but now in, in mares. So this was performed by Karini doing her master. And also, again, we look at the cell size and luteal blood perfusion. In this case, we just classify them as low or high blood perfusion. And once again, we could detect that the only difference between the animals uh, regarding the ultrasonography characteristics was the luteal blood perfusion. So there was no difference in the luteal error between pregnant and non-pregnant recipients. Uh, in this case, the P4, the plasma P4, tended to be greater in those mares uh, detect as, uh, as pregnant. So when you compare the the, the groups of animals, uh, there were no difference between small and large CL regarding the pregnancy rate. But again, we saw that mares with a high blood perfusion, the corpus luteum they had a greater pregnancy rate. The difference here was about 35% of difference, right? And when it did the, the regression analysis, uh, the same occur as you saw in beef cattle. So have a positive and li linear relationship between luteal blood perfusion and probability of pregnancy. So how can we now uh, enhance the, the reproduction performance using this uh, technology. 
So in this case, if you have excess of recipient, that's not common. Uh, we can reserve the recipients with low blood perfusions, and then you can increase the pregnancy rate because we're using only the animals with high blood perfusion, right? But what's more common is to have a lack of recipients at the time of embryo transfer. So uh, we have to use all the recipients in this case. And uh, what? how can you use that, this information? So what we can do is uh, we always have some uh, preferable uh, breeding or some embryos with higher ma uh, genetic merit. So we can transfer this embryo to those uh, recipients with the high blood perfusion. So that, that one, one alternative to use uh, this technology. And as final considerations, um, I just want to highlight some limitations of using the Doppler. Just to remember that we need uh, specialized operators to do that. Uh, the scanning is really important. So who's going to do that need to practice to have a good interpretation. Uh, maybe softwares or machine learning is uh, artificial intelligence can help in the future, but uh, I consider now that the most important thing is to have a good uh, training uh, operator to do that. The settings is also really important. So just here, just an example of one of our, uh, our publications. Uh, change, for example, in PRF can change a lot the color signals in the image. Uh, we also have some artifacts that could be disturbing the interpretation. So uh, all these settings should be really uh, set up before I use that in the field. And as take home message here, I like to highlight that um, you can use the Doppler to detect the function of the corpus luteum uh, during these two periods, uh, during luteal genesis and also during luteal period. And for fixed time programs, you also can use to select the recipients with the better receptive at the time of the embryo transfer, and also to identify the non-pregnant animal. So if you associate that with our early uh, resynchronization protocol, we can have some positive impact uh, in reproduction and uh, economic performance. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, all the research, the companies and the farm for most of these studies we have uh, done with the help of them, our team, uh, some of the past, some now uh, uh, students that we have now in the lab. And also, uh, just to, to let here an invitation, I will have an important meeting in Brazil in August. Uh, Mario will be here, right? So I'd like to invite them to, to go to the SBT and check uh, our speakers and if you're interested to to, to participate in this, this important meeting for us. So with that, thank you. And I'd be glad to have any question to, to answer. Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Thank you, Guilherme, for, for the presentation. Uh, lots of very good and applied information. So thanks for much, thank, thanks so much for that. Uh, I uh, by mistake I, I told you before that you you'd be able to ask your questions using the microphone. Uh, th th this is not the case. The microphones are enabled in this meeting, so please uh, type your questions in the Q and A box. So um, I'll start, uh, Guilherme, with some questions that are here in the Q and A box. Um, so first from Lucas Mello, uh, great presentation. Have you observed any environmental factors? such as handling stress or heat stress that might briefly increase blood perfusion at Doppler evaluation, leading to an overestimation. Great. Oh, thank you for the question. Uh, it's a really nice question. Uh, well, we did not look at you to this environment uh, factors, uh, but I believe we can have some, some interference uh, regarding uh, those that could be affecting the the temperature or the vasodilatation of this this uh, these vessels, right? Uh, but actually, I, I don't know how they interfere with the the blood perfusion. We have not looked into that. 
Next question is from uh, Eric Rooker. Uh, when evaluating perfusion area, are you doing it based upon total luteal area or as a percentage of the external diameter perfused? As total area 40 versus 50% seems quite hard to differentiate when looking at total area. Yeah, if, if I understand the question, uh, what we doing is looking to the proportion, consider the, the, the total area of the corpus luteum, right? So, and I agree, uh, if you look at maybe 40 to 50, uh, it's uh, the difference not too much, you know? So, but this, uh, this is the reason that I said that we, we need to practice. And if you want to do that for research, that maybe this five, 10 person can uh, have a, a, a great meaning, uh, you have to be consistent in these evaluations. So, uh, what we usually do here in the lab is like uh, do the, the evaluation, and then we can record what you, you, you did. And then go back uh, some days later without knowing what you gave before and see if you have a really good correlation. And uh, if you have, if you practice, uh, I'm sure that you can reach a really high correlation. That's what we do for all the students here. And uh, we are always getting this correlation, right? But it's subjective. So sometimes you can give 45 and then you go there and say that's 50. But uh, you're not you never be saying uh, a different like uh, 20 to 50 or 10 to 60 right so it's really consistent uh, Eric has another question but I'm just gonna uh, go down the line a bit and then I'll come back to his other question so Pamela Armstrong is asking can post wave Doppler be used to detect blood perfusion of the CL Post wave Doppler. Uh, you can use the post post wave. Uh, the problem is that we need uh, a large vessel, you know. So you can put the 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 trans the transducer uh, pretty close to the the uh, ovarian artery. You have some ramifications, and most of them are going to the corpus luteum to 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 support right uh, the blood there so if you go to the to the cl tissue it's really hard so we have to look into this vessel that are just uh coming from this these ramifications right from the the ovary artery and the problem is uh you can have a average um a velocity right and we, doing that, you can also have some index. That's the the resistance index uh, and the pulsatile index. So those you can have um, association with the CL blood perfusion, but they're not so many as the proportion. So uh, and it's also time constant. So. That, that's the reason that for us, it's not uh, practical, you know, to use in the field, but you can do, you can do, you really can do. Uh, but the post wave, it's more interesting to, to do when you have a, a really large vessel and you know, in a way that you can correct the angle of the, the blood uh, with, the, with the, the probe, right? So, because doing that, you can really, uh, you can you can really have the the speed, the the velocity of the of the blood uh, blood flow. Uh, without that, you just have idea of the blood perfusion, but not the velocity, not the blood flow exactly in that fashion. I don't I don't know if I was uh, clear in the the, the answer, Mario. No, you're clear. Uh, Andy Meadows has a question. Thank you for an excellent presentation. In light of the fact that extra label use of estradiol is not legal in the U.S., are you aware of any other work using GNRH for your resync protocols? Yeah. Uh, 
that that's a it's a issue if you consider the countries that uh, they don't allow the use of stradiol, you know, because you you know the benefits of the stradiol in this dose, and there is no impact in consider residuals in in the meat or or milk. But uh, if you don't if you cannot use stradiol, uh, your option uh, will be using only the P4 device. If you associate with generation, it's the other option because you can base a, a protocol on association of P4 and Stradiol or generation, right? You have the off-sync that it's allowed, for example, in US. Uh, but the problem to use the generation that uh, to be efficient, we have to, to have ovulation, right? Uh, after the first generation, the protocol. And if you have that, you're going to have a new CL. And then you're going to put uh, a confounding factor because you can have a, a new CL and also an old CL from the, the previous ovulation. Um, but that, that's a possibility. But you have to be really good to distinct these two CLs, right? So in this case, I know, for example, uh, Dr. Uh, Rodolfo Luzbel from Argentina they uh, are starting some protocols in dairy animals uh, using the generase at uh, the beginning of this type of protocol. But as I said, we, we need uh, better information. If you have a, a previous CL uh, and which side is was the previous CL, and then you have to check if it's a new CL or not. So it's kind of, it's a little bit more complicated to this chain, right? So, in our group, we decide to use the, the low dose of Stradiol or injectable P4, as I said, because we still can use that in Brazil. But yeah, could be a other option, the use of generase associated with the P4 device. But I just highlight this point. You have to, another confounding factor that you have, uh, you have to consider, right? Uh, back to another question from Eric uh, Rooker. Uh, you posted a picture of the uh, IMV Go Doppler mo uh, model. Do you use the base setting or what recommendation do you have for using a model with less flexibility to adjust the settings? Uh, I don't know if I understand the first way. The, the I which model you said? So he said that you, you posted a picture of the IMV Go Doppler mo uh, model. Oh, okay. So, okay. do you use, so do you use the base settings or what recommendation do you have for using a model with less flexibility to adjust the settings? Yeah, yeah. Each model, we we need to to, to have uh, the exact setting to, to, to compare, right? Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, we're not... Uh, we do not work a lot of this, this model that uh, he mentioned. But we have uh, tried that, and it's it's also able to do this evaluation. Uh, I agree that we, we do not have a, a high range of setting, but you, you have the minimal uh, needed for for this type of evaluation. So each model for each brand, we we have kind of uh, already range that you can put the PRF, the the gain, also the frequency of the machine. But in each one, we have to, to put one machine beside the other that you already know uh, the setting and then try to find the best setting of that new machine, that new model. So the same was for the, the easy scan goal uh, of the IMV it was the same. We did that and we can also uh, have uh, a nice uh, evaluation of the CL using the this this model um oh, we have we have a, we have a few more questions but but let, let me ask you one question first uh sure. and I'll just i just do you i'll just use do it using the microphone um uh have you have you documented embryo or pregnancy losses associated with the different uh resynchronization strategies Day 14 versus day 22 versus day 40, are they pretty comparable or do you see any of these resynchronizations generating more embryo losses? Yeah, right. it's, it's a good question. Um, well, what, what I can say is um, 
we, we did not look at too much to that. Uh, uh, but it, we know and uh, one of the studies performed by, by Miller from uh, University of uh, Lavras, uh, he has showed that using the, for example, the this early uh, resynchronization, super early resynchronization day 13, uh, compared to a group not synchronized, that there is no impact uh, in pregnancy loss in, or in pregnancy maintenance, right? Uh, but the comparative other resynchronization, we, we did not look into that. Uh, I don't know if, if you mentioned more compared to the other resynchronization. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, but yeah, we, we did not, we just look into the first uh, uh, pregnancy check, but not further to see uh, to have more pregnancy loss. Thank you. Uh, Felipe Ruiz is asking, uh, would a seven day CL with poor blood perfusion be related to body condition score? Hmm. Well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's a good question, but yeah, could, could be related. Uh, we not we did not look into that, so I I don't know that the answer if you have a correlation or not. Uh, actually, I'm really interested to to what could be affecting the CL blood perfusion. So then we can think on strategies to increase the CL blood perfusion and have a greater proportion of these animals, right? So if the body condition score is one of the factors related to that, could be. And maybe you have to, to, to look more to the nutrition strategies, but also we can maybe look at specific molecules to do that. And yeah, um, so could be one factor, but uh, we didn't check that. Uh, Romulo uh, Rizende. He said, excellent presentation, Guilherme. Are you looking forward uh, the use of in dairy cows using GNRH PGF based time AI programs? The late luteolysis can also be a challenge regarding high production dairy cows. Yeah, that, that's true, Homo. Uh, for dairies, uh, the late luteolysis, uh, it's, it's one of the issues, right? And we know. From some studies, based from University of Wisconsin, uh, that show uh, a high proportion of cows having a luteolysis after day 22, 23, and like they have active CL on day 20, 22, so they probably be one of the false positives. So this is this is one of the limitations when we look at this type of protocol for dairy. So um, this is what I'm seeing here in Brazil. You're using the Doppler for this uh, super resynchronization uh, since 2014, 15. There are many practitioners doing that in beef, right? Uh, but not in dairy because uh, we have this, this issue related to the great, uh, to the high uh, false positive results. And part of that is related to this these late luteolites and also pregnancy loss. We know that these animals are under uh, really challenging environment and physiological uh, issues. So uh, they have more pregnancy loss compared to the beef, right? So, but uh, regarding the junior age, uh, it's it's quite similar to what I said. Uh, the problem is to choose the junior age and have a new CL. So, I don't know if you'd be really practical right in this in this condition. So we are not we are not testing that uh, in our in our conditions. We have a, a, a one more question from from Eric uh, Rooker. Uh, he is a field practitioner, but he doesn't have many other people around him that's using the technique. So he's asking uh, when you started learning and developing this technology, did you do your initial correlation learning comparing to something like? Uh, pixel flux <laughs> are you familiar with that yeah yeah well we, we did uh ac actually what i did first was um like i was i was in my my phd uh was 2010 university of wisconsin i was following a postdoc uh guy that was doing his research and what I learned uh, looking to what he was given as a valuation, as I said, from zero to 100. So he all, I was always thinking on my mind, 
what to be the proportion from zero to 100. And then uh, I, I look at to what he gave. This was the, the beginning. But then what I did was uh, I, I did uh, a bunch of uh, exams uh, using a Doppler. I gave my evaluation right in the bar. Then uh, I, I record the, the videos and then I, I went to the to the lab some, some days later and check again without knowing what I gave and did the correlation. And the correlation was 0.8 something. So it was, was really high. Uh, but it also did some, I helped in one of the studies that did this comparison of pixels. Uh, the correlation is really high. So we, ha we have done that in, in, in the beginning. If you look at you, to some studies from Dr. Ginter's lab, uh, we, we have data on that. So, uh, but, but remember to, to do the pixel, the, the operator have to select the, the image, right? So it, it's still subjective in my mind because depending on the image that you get and put there, so you can have more color signals. So, uh, but yes, the, the correlation is high. But I not start doing that, you know, because it's really time consuming to to get the counting, the pixel counting of one image <laughs> take a long time to do that. So I prefer to start practicing, as I said. So I go with someone that's already doing that, or like in Brazil, have some course, some ways to to teach that. Uh, after that. The, the best way is to, to do this blind evaluation by yourself. Like you try again to get the same issue, record that and, and see if you have a really high correlation, right? But uh, if you're not doing research, I maybe you, are, it, you don't need to be too, uh, to worry about that because actually if you wanna check the, the practicing status, it's active or not. So it's kind of one cutoff. You just have to see if you, have blood in the board and go to the center and it's correspond more than 30 percent right so it's much more simpler uh compared to that low medium and high so depending on what your focus what your main objective maybe you don't don't need to be so precise you know to to do that thank you Guilherme for uh, well First, uh, thank, thanks. I would, I'd like to thank everybody that's asking questions. That's been a very good discussion. Uh, hopefully, uh, Eric and everybody else, as we see the interest for Doppler ultrasonography increasing here in the U.S. by practitioners, you know, there are people at University of Georgia, University of Missouri, University of Florida, Virginia Tech, many of us here at the BRTF that are uh, better and better uh, on using this this technologies, you know, and as demand increases, we might be able to offer courses and offer opportunities for learning. Uh, Guilherme, thank you uh, very much one more time for your time, for your insights, for your presentation, for your answers. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Guilherme's contact, I think he, he showed it on the beginning of the presentation. Please get in touch with him directly if you have questions. If not, uh, I'd like to uh, turn it back to, to Victor or maybe we just finish the presentation but thanks everybody thank you Guilherme for thank you thank you, Mario. Thank, you. thank you for the opportunity and thank you everyone for for the question uh, it's a great honor to to be here in this webinar thank you